Hello Geek Show, my name is Alex and with me I got, as always, Eric. Hi Eric. Hi Alex. Wow, how are you? The weather in Germany is pretty bad right now. It's so freezing cold. It's super, super cold. It was minus six degrees in Cologne today. That's normally... just, just minus six. I had minus 12. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's so super cold in throughout the whole journey. And yeah, for that, we need a hot topic, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think I think we got <laughs> we got one. So with us, we got Christina Licati. Christina, please introduce yourself. Hi, I, we also had a pretty cold weather and that's why it's good that <laughs> now we have the hot topics to warm everyone up in this snow. My name is Christina Lecati. I am a social engineering expert. I work with Cyberis GmbH, a company my father started. And I am now doing the social engineering development in a program, in a training program we are going to deliver. The company in general is about tra training in cybersecurity issues and my background has thrown me in the social engineering <laughs> and that's thing. a super tough uh, topic right because it is social engineering is topic. everywhere these days everybody's like hey we have to deal with social engineering we have to get in touch we have to understand what's going on and we how we can protect right Exactly. And everybody's like, okay, we have done a very good job with this technology. We have an excellent security, but then, oh, but then there is a user of this technology. Damn, we have users. <laughs> yes. And then it's like, wow, we have invested a great amount of deal to, to get the, the best and most sophisticated tech. And then, whoa, somebody clicked on something they shouldn't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's kind of like, um, being very excited about something but then no <laughs> so yes okay. your presentation says or has the, the title preaching security through social engineering the unpatched human vulnerabilities yes and practically it is a topic about what happens when an attacker wants to bypass the security technology and then targets the vulnerabilities of the user that uses technology i said but let's not stay in the introduction let's forget everything about social engineering and what we know and let's start with the story let's just say you are the bank staff in a typical business day that supports diamond trading and let's say there is a man a very successful diamond trader that just walks into a bank to do businesses always he's a very good guy he becomes a frequent visitor for about a year being a customer. And of course, as it naturally happens, he gets to know everyone in the bank. He befriends everyone. He chats with them. He's a good pal, kind pal. He brings them chocolates from the chips. Clearly, they begin having a relationship. And of course, through all that, oops, he ends up becoming a valued, trusted customer. So then naturally, he also wins privileged access to the vaults, being such a good customer, and an electronic key to it. On a typical Monday, like always, he visits the vault. Clearly, he has won the employee's confidence being there so, for so often throughout the whole year, knowing them, almost treating to them like family. So he is also left alone in the vault. He exits the same day, the same vault, and the bank with 120 cards of diamonds worth 28 million, of course, not being their own, since he compromised several open safety deposit boxes in that same bank, stole them, took them with him, and just opened the door and left. That sounds like a good plan, though. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a pretty impossible story, right? A, a little far-fetched even more if you think that this bank had a, again a very sophisticated high-tech security system worth of one million dollars it sounds a little far-fetched and like a tale but the no, is... daily business i think <laughs> yeah exactly was it no it was not and here is what the what the papers wrote and i find them so funny my favorite thief charms 15 million pounds in diamonds from a bank and what they wrote, of course, if you're a social engineer aspiring to become a bank robber, there is good news. You need patience, luck, and charms. Oh, and it helps if you have chocolates. I appreciate <laughs> a lot. <laughs> they stayed a lot on the bar that he brought chocolates to the employees. 
National Geographic wrote about it, The Telegraph, The Independent, uh, it was all over the news, CNN, fake beards and chocolates, <laughs> multiple diamond highs. But the bottom line is this. It sounds like a mad story originally. And the thing with social engineering is that it should sound like it because this is how it works. It defines everyday common logic and also how things work. And in fact, it, it exploits the unexpected. Another favorite title, how to rob a bank with chocolates. They all love the chocolates part. <laughs> <laughs> That's <Nature>. good. <laughs> yeah, human nature. This was in fact a very true story, however. It was the ABN AMRO bank heist in Antwerp, in Belgium, which is also the area where almost half the world's traded diamonds are being traded. The police said about this heist that it was in plan for over a year, and it was also called the biggest bank robbery committed by one person. The man used the name Carlos Hector, Hector Flommenbaum. He registered, of course, everything was fake papers from a stolen passport in Israel, fake identity. And of course, it left everybody in the staff wondering what happened and how, how could they be so lured into giving out so much trust to a person that not only yeah, access things he was not supposed to access, but he had a fake ID to begin with. What happened there? <laughs> so, and the bottom line is that although they had such a sophisticated security system, it did nothing. And it was also what the spokesman of the Diamond High Council brought up. He said to the media, the lesson is that despite all the efforts one makes in investing in security, when a human error is made, nothing can help. Hmm. Classic social engineering, as we said before, and now to someone that would think that this is just an elaborate bank robbery, and this only happens if you have a really big goal in mind, and yeah, no. It is a very typical approach in physical preaching attacks. But this was some kind of an on-premises attack, no? <laughs> yes, of course, but social engineering can happen remotely, it can happen face to face. In fact, it's usually easier when it happens face to face because they don't allow you a lot of time to think in between and they can guide your behavior on spot. Yeah, okay. So, um, and in-premises attacks are very, very common, more common than what is known. And of course, nobody wants to admit that they left a stranger in their premises. The media, they, the companies try to hide these stories from the media like hell. I bet. But clearly. And now why they would go to the physical premises and risk so much, risk themselves practically because you go in person, you don't hide behind the computer, right? Right. But there are a lot of good things that can happen out of it. For example, you get access to servers. If you gain trust and you are left to roam around freely, you just go and install things here and there, practically. You install, install backdoors, you get remote control, you can, get inform you can harvest information, you get network access, you get all kinds of goodies from whatever is available to you in the company. Because you can just put your hands on it. You damage hardware, which is very, very typical in corporate espionage. They don't just want to steal your information. They would like to ruin you a little bit as well. Because, you know, getting breached is not good enough if you can do more damage for competition. <laughs> yes. And of course, there is hardware theft. And I have seen so many times in companies, um, the staff living around USB is unprotected. Um, oh, yes. Hard drives unprotected. I believe everybody has especially law firms, consulting companies, it's a very low level priority for them to know what happens with things that lie around. And it's, it's also a common thing on uh, large conferences that guys uh, keep their USB sticks sticking around at the presentation laptops Absolutely. and then just uh, visit the toilet again and <laughs> uh, but on the stick is not just the presentation <laughs> yes, <laughs> so there's even more on it. And it's also the, 
there is so much trust between your friends in a conference. In fact, that was a very funny thing because it happened yesterday in an event that was about data protection and the GDPR. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because there was the speaker talking about data protection and how you shouldn't leave your things around. And he was like, for example, right now, this whole time, I see two USBs lying on my pod. And I don't know who they belong to, but they just left them here. And I don't know <laughs> what is in there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, it would be so lucrative for anybody that finds them to just plug them in. And in the end, the people that owned these USBs, they were so embarrassed afterwards. But it was a good lesson for everyone. Fabio and myself were at the Blue Hat conference in uh, Israel a few weeks ago. And mm -hmm. uh, within one of the, the breaks between two sessions, uh, we were in the uh, huge uh, area where the food and everything was. And somebody has just left his uh, PC unlocked at one table. And we're thinking, Aww. is this a trap? Or is this just really a very, very stupid fellow who has just forgotten or just not thinking who who and with with whom he's on this conference with and wow. it's just like why can that happen <laughs> <laughs> but see this is also the good part because you actually knew a little bit about it you didn't dig into the computer and then get breached yourself <laughs> but yeah. it's always this point in between when you know that it's like is this now for real or is this a trap? Yeah, we didn't do that because we thought it's uh, definitely a trap. Nobody is, could be that <laughs> stupid uh, to leave his machine unlocked for minutes on, on, at the hacker conference. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Yes, humans. I have even seen and thought the same way when I saw a car completely unlocked, open windows and keys on the engine. A good car on a street. And I was like, it's, this must be a trap. It cannot be anything else. It's a trap. <laughs> or, or just trust, trust in humanity. So. Trust <laughs> in humanity. Nobody's going to take it. <laughs> or just complete Idealistic. stupidness. It could be anything. That is a thing. Better safe than sorry is a good go-to. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. It, isn't it in Sweden where, it's, uh, where you don't lock your door? You just put something in front of the door so everybody knows that you are not at home and nobody goes in there. So yeah, <laughs> imagine so something right. like this in Germany. <laughs> but in Germany, yes. they also leave uh, doors unlocked, in my knowledge. And yeah. I'm always like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Better safe than sorry. <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Yes, if uh, somebody gets one lesson out of this talk, better save. Better think twice before you leave something out there. And yes, it also extends on the door policy. You see it's everywhere. It's in your if it's in your home, it will definitely be in your company as well. So I will move on with the, what they get their hands on. Files along with the hardware, sensitive papers, records. In fact, I have seen in penetration testing people just entering in an office through a whatever story, and they, they, yeah, the person they were supposed to meet goes for a coffee way too often. They don't even need to drink that many coffees. And then they just steal papers. They take them home, and they can be very sensitive papers. And of course, the old but good password harvesting. Have you, are you still seeing people putting their usernames and passwords all over their desks no, and never. leaving them there no never never ever never <laughs> ever everybody knows it by now no one is doing it anymore <laughs> somehow it's still a thing <laughs> and last but all least also the but goody to just stick an infected usb with malware or a keylogger and then the rest is easy I've, you have done your entry. I've recently started again with the um, uh, how, uh, uh, how what was the hacking series called, uh, Mr. Robert, uh, oh. That, oh yes, where that fellow uh, sold his uh, CDs, his tracks on on the street, and and uh, the the other guy from the security company just bought one of the CDs, uh, which had a, a malware on it, and installed oh. that uh, sneaky 
payload which uh, did the connection re reverse tcp to the hacker's machine where he could then uh -huh. trap all the uh, webcam snapshots and so far that was really funny so yeah <laughs> mean we see this very often and then you go to the person and you say what did you do why yeah. and he tells you why did you think my job was just selling cities on the street <laughs> please <laughs> There's a lot of motivation for people to do that in reality. It's a business. It's not just hacking for the sake of hacking. It's, there is also a job. I know there is a common term, hacking as a service. So <laughs> it could be your day job. So if, if we see Alex in Cologne selling USB drives or CDs, we, we should not buy them. <laughs> Don't start with this. I was uh, telling Alex last time that one day we were doing a small awareness talk. And remember, Alex, mm -hmm. last talk? Yeah. And there was a guy in the audience that approached afterwards and he was like, so this is a lucrative business. You make so much money out of selling data. And he was just getting so interested in how the process works in breaching that it was getting really uncomfortable. And I actually had to say at some point, uh, you do know that this is rather illegal, right? And you're not supposed to do it. And he just told me in my face, yes, but it sounds like such a good deal for somebody that doesn't make as much as they should. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's very uncomfortable. You yeah. tell them, look, forensics are going to get to you. There's a lot of dirt out there. There are a lot of really nasty people that are just, I mean, if you see, if you have a look at your your mailbox, which is maybe hosted with uh, uh, any mail provider that is not uh, that good in protecting his um, his customers from from malware, you just see mm -hmm. how how frequent they get punished or penetrated with emails that are really. I saw uh, even yesterday I saw someone who had uh, up a, a Microsoft login page that was pretty familiar to the uh, original oh. Microsoft login page. And I was like, okay, I haven't seen this page being showing up in, in, in any of my um, presentations or something like that. So oh. these guys get better and better. And I think the, the, the scope of people that can be attacked is just growing by day. So. It's exactly like that. And it's a, exactly what you say. It's getting more sophisticated. And we don't even have artificial intelligence yet yeah. involved with this. Slightly. Right. So, But wait until that comes. All right. So tell us what's uh, social engineering then? It is the art and science <laughs> of skillfully maneuvering human beings to take action in some aspect of their lives that may or may not be in their best interest. So exactly what we were saying ab above, they drive you into certain behavior and it's actually not in your best interest. It is in their best interest. Who does that? Who are the social engineers? They are hackers, but they are the human type of hackers. They aim at penetrating security systems, just like the technology hackers, but through their employees of a company for the same reasons, to elicit valuable information, to get data, to steal money, to commit corporate espionage. Now we also have state-sponsored attacks that are a lot more elaborate. And because the whole approach is so subtle and usually very smooth, and as you said, it gets more and more sophisticated, they are very hard to detect. It's just that you don't realize it is coming to you that easily if you don't know what you what to look for. Yeah, <laughs> Eric and myself. I think that's a a, a great point to to uh, bring up your uh, example from the last Trust Tech event, Eric. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was pretty interesting. So mm -hmm. yeah, we received it was less. Uh, we received an uh, invitation on Xing mm -hmm. from from someone. Just, just don't mind him. He he looked nice and he he did something with tech and uh, so yeah we both accepted it mm -hmm. and then there was a presentation at the tech event and <laughs> he showed us this this was a fake profile and he just did it to steal our personal information <laughs> oh. and and everybody in the room so it wasn't just uh, 
both of us, it was some were some more in the room, um, and and all of them were like, oh my god, yes, I clicked up, uh, I clicked accept, and uh, I I didn't know what this means, and <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so so what he technically technically did was he was uh, looking through into the the meetup, um, mm -hmm. the the event itself, and then he grabbed out all the um, pictures, the profile pictures that um, the the people ha had set up. And um, <coughs> then he put it into a picture database and uh, connected a Xing profile to it. And he just compared uh, every picture that was the same picture in the meta platform than on Xing with the, the picture database. And then he just added everybody who was matched uh, uh -huh. to this new profile. And that was the, the exact uh, procedure of, the, of this attack. So that was pretty cool though. That was a lesson learned right. on point. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh yes, absolutely. And Eric and, and mm. myself, we were just afterwards. We were like, okay, well, even it's not very sensitive information, so we don't really care about. I mean, Sing is there for just for uh, sharing your information. Sharing your yeah. information, right? Mm. It's the same information that you send out on on or did he, did he get, uh, hand over to to fellows that come over on any event throughout your your cards your your business cards something like that so even if it's not sensitive information we just don't don't know who we add each and every day because eric and, mm. and myself we have a really bad um uh, uh we, we cannot remember people that good so we we, we <laughs> very often lose the names and 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 so far and so it was like okay even that guy was just a virtual or was like a social engineering attack we wouldn't even um not figure out. It. so it's not and it, when the when the, the the he's doing his 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 job matches to what we normally see so we have a very good firewall to 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 say uh with um with guys that that want to offer us a job right so mm -hmm. even, or especially eric he's he's uh, pretty pretty good at uh, identifying who is trying to offer a job or not and mm -hmm. we can identify that but if it's just a, a tech guy that wants to connect we don't even mind so yes because you are supposed to have this yeah. um, behavior on social media you are supposed to exactly. showcase your st your skill you are supposed to showcase yourself also because it's good for your personal brand exactly and but, absolutely yeah. Mm, and that's why there is a, always a big conflict between uh, security and marketing. They just fight with each other very much. Because when you do share, it's on one aspect good, on the other aspect, if you don't know how to handle what you share and the people that approach you through that, it becomes a huge vulnerability. And um, this thing with creating fake profiles and then just adding people, adding your whole network and you to establish a level of, yes, I'm part of the tribe, mm -hmm. is very typical in social media. It is one of the classics, generally. And because it's so simple, if people know about it, it still works, like magic. Okay. So, okay, can you maybe give us a little bit more insights on how such a social engineering attack works? Through social media. There are people who create fake profiles and they might add everybody in your network. And then you as well. You see that you share so many connections with them. You add them back. Then they might start a conversation with you if you are the target. And just, you know... They kind of profile you through whatever you have put on online. I have done a talk like this. It's pure, clean cut profiling that a psychologist would do. So he figures out what you want, what are your interests, what um, what kind of things appeal to you and you would love to talk about. And he approaches you with exactly these things. And long story short, in with one of 1000 scenarios then he can just send you something that would be in your interest you have already talked with this person so he feels rather familiar and he might be like oh look uh, since we had this conversation the other day i also found this that could be interesting for you test it you click on it and it's a malware 
this is one of the thousand approaches. But because you have encountered this person and it is he is so familiar to you and you have already talked, there is a certain level of trust. So they can either just send you a link, they could even come to you and then have a physical penetration okay. because you know them after all. So what, what would you say, how, how long does it take? So is it, is it a yeah. thing of, of minutes or is it a thing of weeks or what, what do you think? It always depends on the target. It could be a minute of seconds. It could be a matter of weeks. So if you are an easy target, you could just click on a link immediately just because you are very naive and don't know what's coming to you. Or another very good one, at the late hours when you are tired and you anyways communicate with this person at the time, you're not really going to think things through, so then they know that's a good time to approach on clicking something. Because you are just tired, you are not going to analyze so much. Okay. Would you, would you second, say that but... you... Mm -hmm. would, would you say that you as a social engineer are aware of all of this and or would you also be entrapped if someone is pretty good in it? Everybody can get trapped. The most renowned social engineers, for example, Christopher Hadnagy, he has reported himself being a victim to attacks as well. <laughs> He's okay. one of the oldest experts. Everybody can get trapped. But it's not a matter of absolute security. It's always a matter of having the best probabilities of survival because it's like a war. It's not a one move thing. It's something you need to be constantly aware of. So any anybody can get breached really. But if you know about it, you increase your chances. And again, another okay. thing is that it's one thing to be to have a successful attack on you from a schoolboy that wanted to impress his first girlfriend. It's a whole other story to have eliminated this possibility of the amateurs, that are most of them, and eventually get bridge from a very deeply professional guy. Okay. It can happen. Okay. But again, security is a process. It is not a product. It is not a one-move thing. It's a process. Oh yeah, I think this is a very important point. So this is what, what many people and many companies think. So it's like we just buy a new product and then everything is secure from itself. And exactly. uh, to understand this, that this is, a, this is a journey and you will always have to improve yourself because the attackers are also improving. This is exactly. something very important. Yeah. Exactly. And it, yeah, it's exactly what you say. It's not a one thing. <laughs> And and what what's your daily business then? So as a social engineer, you are really attacking, or you are trying to make people aware, or is it both of this, or are you testing companies, or? If I am a penetration tester right now, I am not because I have my hands full with developing the training product, the okay. training program. We are also in conversations for a book because truly there is not enough knowledge distributed around about these issues. But in the past, I used to be part of forensic investigation programs that we were doing in companies. For example, sometimes you did have the job of finding who actually leaked the information. And then you have to go through the interviews. I was part of a team, of course. Um, you have to go through the interviews. You have to assess body language and you have to, to assess deception and to spot it. Usually, it leaks out through a lot of things. And you can actually see who is lying on what, then persists on this point. There is an investigator that does the questioning. It's a process. So I have been part of, part of projects like this in the past. Okay. It's very interesting. And it's very intriguing as well. <laughs> Usually, this happens when there is corporate espionage happening then yeah but now we are developing the training program to educate others on how to deal with these things yeah yep okay so i will i actually have a background in psychology and this is why i can understand these things and focus and assess 
This is where my competitive advantage comes into picture, the whole psychology background. And also because social engineers themselves have a very good knowledge of psychology and they exploit it. So on their skill set point that is moving on the presentation, okay, not every hacker, but if you go to the big game of hacking and social engineering, they do have excellent knowledge of psychology. They can elicit emotions in you and guide you through these emotions. They can put you in a yes chance, meaning they have you agree with things and because there is a need for consistency in humans, once you start saying yes, it's very difficult for you to start saying no to a person and put boundaries. So they use that. They develop charm and likability on demand as well. And they have very advanced influence and persuasion skills because the stakes are high. So they have to. They manifest all these in elaborate strategies and they direct human behavior. But of course, there is always, always the countermeasure part when somebody, like what our company has done in the past, finds out the strategies to counter that. Let's see, however, how the backbone of a typical attack goes. Clearly, there is a preparation phase, the information gathering. So practically, what this guy at the meetup did, they, he harvests your information so that you know what you are about, what we discussed with social media. He knows what are your likes, how he can start conversation with you, how he can get you to trust him. But of course, on a larger scale, if this is a company. And then he identifies the best possible victims and targets. He clearly is not going to go to everyone. There is not time for that. He doesn't have to. He just needs one good lead. Then what he does is that he pretext the approach, meaning he plans out his story, in what kind of context is he coming into to introduce himself to you, but also what kind of personality he is, what is his personal brand, something that you would accept to deal with, to open up to. And this is the preparation. And then when it comes down to the execution, he approaches, he gains trust, Exactly what Carlos did in the very first story. He and he then drives the desired behavior to exploit this trust. Again, what we were saying before, he will have you do things with pleasure for them that you would never do if you knew what they were about. And once it's all nice and done, he just leaves and you are left wondering if something actually happened or you know something happened, but it's too late to do anything about it. These, are, these steps might take a while or might be more compressed and take less time. It always depends on the target. It always depends on the goal of the attack. But generally, they are essential steps. That's why sometimes it's also important to just stick on the information part and not leak out online too much. Do not overshare on media, for example, on social media. Hmm. Now, in a lot of trainings, there is also the fact, and in a lot of talks, that people focusing on, for example, the top five phishing emails to avoid. You have all seen this, right? Top five attacks, most used attacks. This is very good, but it's also the case that once it's out there, it's known, so it might not be used again. So here, <clears throat> the other aspect is that whatever of these attacks happens in person, they also happen on the digital space. The same vulnerabilities they touch upon in person attacks they also touch upon in digital social engineering attacks. And that's why having the examples is not enough. It's also knowing about what kind of emotions they try to elicit to you and exploit. And so that you, when this happens, you can be aware that it could not be something real, but something manipulated. So for example, if somebody elicits fear in you, it would be good to know that, whoa, I am scared, but I don't have to respond right now, and maybe I shouldn't, because this could be a manipulated situation, instead of just responding to your emotion. 
But fear is not the only one. In fact, a lot of um, human wiring is touched upon in social engineering. And some of it is all in the personality and the very, very basic human traits. So, for example, greed. Uh, sympathy and empathy it is what Carlos, from the first story, what he exploited. Helpfulness and kindness, reciprocation. Okay, it's a whole list of things. But the point is not about not having these traits or emotion. Uh, this is not something that would be advocated in a counter social engineering training. It's more about learning to handle them. So, for example, don't let them guide your behavior. We are all emotional to an extent and we are all dri driven by emotion, but there needs to be boundaries. So the training is about really learning to think twice and not respond <laughs> immediately. <laughs> That's a good good idea to to uh, learn people to think twice. That helps in that yes. each and every way you are. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and because everybody might think that oh, this is my vulnerability. I should stop being empathetic and kind. No, come on, <laughs> you're not supposed to be the type of person that locks himself in a dark room. It's only about learning how to handle things the situations and knowing what is going to be targeted but mainly it's about putting freaking boundaries to others so he might be very a very very likable person but keep a boundary to what kind of information you give to just anyone and keep a boundary to what you give access to as a person right right <laughs> this has been used even in the Cold War as an approach. Okay. Exploiting emotion. And in fact, it was called espionage. <laughs> Do you have any state of the art examples for uh, social engineering or the emotional manipulation? State of the art. I have further on some phishing emails. Cool. That show how this emotion is practically getting exploited and what types of emotions. So that you won't necessarily have to remember here. So that you won't necessarily have to remember the specific type of email, but just the fact that it is supposed to elicit a certain emotion and you're not supposed to respond to it. Clearly the same principles are uh, used online and offline. And here are some typical phishing, emotional eliciting emails. For example, fear. Um, there was this email going around about having to appear in court and that if you do not attend the hearing, the judge may issue a warrant. Fear. So the, then you click on it to see what happened. So this email says, a notice to appear. Hereby you are noti notified uh, that you have been scheduled to appear for your hearing at our county courthouse. Please bring all documents and witnesses relating to this case with you to the court on your hearing date and then attach, which is scary yeah and then attach <laughs> there's just a, a the court notice yeah a court notice and you have to click here like always click here of course <laughs> but it's in reality a malware and it leads you to a photo for or not found page accidentally and then you don't know what is wrong with your computer but in fact everything is now wrong with your computer <laughs> yeah <laughs> Good one. Yes. <laughs> and then there is another tendency to comply to authority. And we all know the CEO scams that say, um, oh, I need you to do this wire transferring for me. It is very urgent. I need it now. You are never supposed to do that, clearly. But people still do it. And in fact, if you have been trained, you respond to it, you have them send their data, and then you report the data to the authorities so that these people can be found. But no, <laughs> this doesn't usually happen. And again, there is the other example here that, hi, Curtis, I'm in a hurry. Can you look at these numbers real quick for me and give me your thoughts? Sent from my iPhone to show the rush. You click on the Excel file, it's malware. <clears throat> 
Of course, there are also the motivational approaches. You receive an email from the IRS, for example, looking very real. It tells you you are eligible to receive a tax return of 300 euros. You immediately think of all the nice things you can do with an extra 300 euros. And then the email writes, (laughs) click get started below to claim your refund. You don't think about it twice. You get started and you get ended at the same time. There is the urgency factor that blocks every human being because when there is an urgency, you don't have the time to think logically. So your cognitive abilities are rather blocked. And there is here an example from PayPal that says, please update your account. They tell you what to do. They write what to do on the email and they say, however, failure to update your records will result in account suspension. Please update your records on or before the 10th of December. And you receive it on the 9th of December. Oh, yeah. There's some pressure. (laughs) Yes, and you have a million other things to think about. You're like, oh, my goodness, I have to deal with this. I have to fix this. And guess what happens when you actually try to fix this and you click on the link they provide. Thinking twice, maybe. You have the personal interest approach, either an invitation to a funeral is something that has been going around a lot from a person you know and you get shocked. You think, who is this person I know? How did they die? And now I just received an email for the funeral. Better call this person and see what happened than click. Your post, your expected post, you have uploaded on social media how excited you are to receive this post. You get a spoofed email that says it's blocked. You need to confirm the shipment. Please get the shipping the shipping label. It's a scam. And the last one is called 2011 recruitment plan. And it has an Excel file of the recruitment plan. And this was the actual email that was sent to the RSA company, a big security company. And this is how the biggest breach on a large security company happened. They sent this email to um, a team of small, uh, low-level employees. It landed on their junk because it was not a very, yeah, (laughs) a very good source from which this was sent. And some people still retrieved it from the junk box. They opened it. They got breached. And then through privilege escalation, there was a big scandal with the amount of information that were stolen from this company that was providing security services. So also on the previous question on whether somebody that knows about it still can get breached, again, yes, because if you have a huge security company protecting you from exactly these things and these people get breached, you understand it's not so difficult. I've I've seen something like this in a, in a customer of mine. Uh, they received the mail uh, that there is a new voicemail in their mailbox, mm-hmm. and they should click the file uh, to hear what's left for them. Uh, issue was they don't have a mailbox service, <laughs> oh. and there have been users clicking on it, and uh, then nothing happened. And four weeks later, uh, um, uh, an encryption trojan started working four weeks later oh. and they recognized it they recognized it when around about six terabytes of data had been encrypted oh, <laughs> so wow. yeah that's a good load <laughs> nice very typical unfortunately now <laughs> so then we have last but not least the curiosity and carelessness and again it goes to not being educated and the fact that ignorance is very, very expensive a lot of times, especially in these cases. And there was another big example on that, very impactful for on the Associated <clears throat> Press incident. They received exactly this mail that is on the screen. Hello, please read the following article. It is very important. A link that looks super legit sent from a different person in the Associated Press and one person in the company clicked on it. So what happened is that they hacked their Twitter account and 
they posted fake news that two explosions in the White House happened and that Barack Obama was injured. This was also the first time that it became extremely clear to everyone how one small thing can damage the economy of the whole country because that tweet alone caused the Dow Jones to collapse completely that day. And everybody, when they found out it was a hack, it was too late because there was already the effect on the Dow Jones. And that was just one tweet. It was not even that elaborate if you think about it. <laughs> but now that's this insane. Way, I mean, that's yes. that's exactly what everybody is so super scared. I mean, just imagine you are you you as a company who's uh, who's uh, trading at at one of these um, very huge uh, um, how's it called. Uh, markets in in in, in Frankfurt stock, market. stock markets or something like that your your company's uh a twitter account gets hacked or uh, and something like this is just posted and and you're complete i mean that's that's super super scary yes it affects so many people and this could also be market manipulation this could be a state sponsored attack it was never really know what was hidden between the motive wow. of this attack. But you can understand the amount of manipulation that can occur, occur on a public level, on an economic level, on a political level, just from a simple curiosity click. Okay, pretty scary sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But now we are finally at the point where we change hats over here and we forget about what we can receive and we put the black hat on. And let's just now imagine that you guys are the attackers. Because then we can now go through an intellectual property example and it's always useful to think like a hacker yourself as well. Are you okay? On <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We feel comfortable <laughs> with that. <laughs> Very comfortable. Don't feel too comfortable in that. <laughs> Let's say you want to steal intellectual property or security. What is the first thing you think about? It's on the slide. Okay. Um, um, who has access to it? Yes. <laughs> the CEO. Yes. Very good. The CEO, definitely. Who else? You do your information gathering. I will cheat. No. Employees that handle this information, you go through it, through your research, you find who is responsible for what, so who handles the IP. Then you find also the people who have access to this information, like the servers that hold them. And then you might also find third parties, for example, consultants. They keep low security usually, unfortunately, not everyone. And less and less, but still a lot of consultants and lawyers don't keep a lot of security on. So let's say you identify the lawyers as well that this company is dealing with and they handle their intellectual property. What is the second step? You think who is a better target from all of them? You do your intelligence analysis and you assess your vulnerabilities, their, vulner their vulnerabilities. And doing all that, you make scenarios as well on what your plan is going to be and the possible approach scenarios. You also do your generally research a little bit so you can find that the company has not done security training. In fact, I have a personal story on how to find this because it sounds very peculiar on the first side, no? Yeah. I think that the people that we work with very commonly, the people who just administrate all the applications or the, let's say, the service below. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of uh, leak it out. They don't even know how sensitive the information is. I mean, you as an IT admin oh. guy, you don't even know. You're, res you're responsible for keeping it running. Exactly. Yeah. You're just responsible that the server is up and running. You don't even know what information is stored on that. Mm. 
Yes. So the way you treat your information is a very good tell, usually on whether you have done security training and you know what you're handling and how. Right. My experience with that when, was when I was very, very young and I went with my dad, already being a cybersecurity expert for some years, to a bank to just get a simple gift card because it was my birthday. And he hadn't told me what's going to happen, but he started making very peculiar questions to the banker while, you know, during this paperwork phase, when you are really bored, but you have to get through the paperwork. He started asking very silly questions like, oh, why is the ceiling so low here? <clears throat> this could uh, be very bad in case of a fire. So something that is very random. And I was thinking, okay, why is he starting to do these questions? This is so embarrassing right now. I had my internal dad moment. <laughs> yes, because I was thinking, these are very really naive questions. And he's a smart man. Why is he doing this silly conversation? This doesn't make any sense. And I'm here. <laughs> and But the thing is, the banker got into a, a whole complaining road. And he started discussing a lot. Plus, my father putting himself in a position where he appeared um, lesser and kind of less important, he made the banker feel very important himself and having a lot to say. And everything he was saying was so interesting and cool. So then the next question came. It was like, okay, you here, you seem very exposed to, to attacks, to if something goes wrong, it sounds like everything is very exposed. Have you even, do you even have any response plans for attacks? There are so many at the news lately. And the guy was like, ah, oh, don't get me started even with this. I have been telling my boss this whole time we need to put some better systems in place. The programs are not updated. They don't work well. Okay, this is a heart attack for this is candy for every social engineer. It's a heart attack for every cybersecurity professional to hear a person, a banker, an employee going on his own, spitting out so much about the security. Mm. And he also said that, no, we haven't done any training. I have been trying to convince my boss to do this. We haven't. This is lack of education, clearly. But it's also a very important piece of information. Would you go out saying that, oh, yeah, we're very exposed. <laughs> This is also bringing a person into a trance of, trance of talking. And then when the flow starts, there can be no end. Hmm. So let's say that in some similar way, this guy found that the company has done no security training. It is also the company's 50th anniversary, very public information usually. And he finds out that the lawyers that handle the company's IP will soon be traveling to another city for an event. Very random things you can just find then he starts assessing how can he bridge the employees with the access maybe everybody expects a bonus he could spoof a bonus email send it to a number of employees just breach quick and dirty easy and it's done again on the previous question of how much time it can take it can take just a few seconds like this then he can do in deep, in depth detail for a tailored attack. Find out, for example, that oh, this guy Tom, he is a frontline person with a customer mind first mindset and a reputation for helpfulness. In this case, he can approach him with an infected USB because he is so helpful after all, and customer comes first. And with a good story, easy peasy. Catherine, on the other hand, if she would be harder to approach but handle a wealth of information, hmm, would be a good target, but she's hard to approach. But at the same time, she, can, she appears to be very active on attending seminars on LinkedIn. And he can also find out, he found out, let's say, that she's having an affair. So two case scenarios, you either spoof another email for a fake seminar invitation from a coworker, or you can blackmail her for this affair because, make no mistake, it can be as dirty as blackmailing. It is a cybersecurity tool, in fact. So your secrets are a very good ground for social engineers. 
And then you might have the guy that is handling all the sensitive documents, but he does not have much information on him online, and he holds security certifications. He, of course, publishes that he has his certifications in place. And in this case, he could be perceived dangerous to approach. Why? Because of what we said before, if something comes to him, not only can he notify everyone else in the company that something is on and they are being targeted, making the social engineers work much more difficult, but he can also manipulate the attacker back if he is on an advanced chain level and in the end report him to the police, like the CEO emails where he actually asked the person back to send him the data of the bank for the transfer and then report them to the police. And last but not least, you have the lawyers that know a lot of things, but often not cybersecurity, and they travel. I don't know if you are familiar with a whole other bunch of rules that exist for traveling. No. Do you know? No, no not really. <laughs> Yeah, in this case, you are just very, very exposed because you don't take care of your bugs, you log in in public Wi-Fi, you are also very susceptible to get your hotel room broken into with some social engineering of the cleaning staff, and I would say in this case, they are very, very good targets if they don't know how to apply travel security. Okay. Yeah. Stay at home. <laughs> you just need to follow a couple of rules in security for traveling, and that's all. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so, how come Did we... we give every, every listener nightmares for tonight so far? <laughs> so, how can we protect our organizations? Yes, and this is the last part here. You can actually do something about it. There are countermeasures. There is a security technology, which if we went into, would give us another year of conversation. And it's not my expertise, but definitely security technology matters. And of course, there is educating the end user. And this involves awareness, but awareness is not enough in terms of knowing how to handle situations. It is, however, still very good and it's way better than nothing. It would be even better if you also involved education in training, so not only what you have to do, but also why, and to practically teach them how to handle situations. For example, how to handle emotional responses. Not that you, that you are driven by the spur of the moment all the time. And of course, to teach them to put boundaries. Like, even if you get scared, even if you like a person to death, keep a boundary on what you provide access to and what you say. It is in reality, it's complicated, but in reality, it's also very simple, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then there are the processes. For example, you know what is going on. What do you do about it? Who do you report to? What happens when there is suspicious activity? Security processes, for example, do not leave your passwords out there. The simplest thing, but very important. And there is also the strategy part, for example, installing honeypots so that you can know what happens when somebody is breaching you. You can identify who did this. But also, even if somebody steals your information, it is this case of... <clears throat> taking things from you, but not knowing if they are necessarily valuable information. It could be honeypots or it could be nothing. Overall, because it involves everybody, a best practice would be to have enterprise-wide training on that, because your assistant can accidentally do something, but your CEO could also be attacked successfully. So it's really for everyone, because everyone is targeted. And this is pretty much all for now. It was, <laughs> it was a big... It, a big it, it was impressive. <laughs> yeah, it was impressive talk, though. Yeah, it, there are so many factors, but it comes down to a backbone. Always. And the same backbone. 
I don't I think... know if you are going to have nightmares. <laughs> uh, maybe, just a bit. Uh, and I, I will think about uh, who am I talking today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or if I, if I don't even tell anything to anyone. <laughs> and that's not nothing that we want to have on uh, on record. So thanks a lot for your talk, Christina. <laughs> yeah. It was very impressive. It's not about not talking to anyone. Mm -hmm. Just remember that. All Talk right. to people and right. be nice. But just don't <laughs> share your password. All right. Okay. It's a rule of thumb. All right. So, we'll do yes. so. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it was good to, to hear all the uh, useful information and impressive, impressive uh, examples. Um, thanks to all the listeners, and uh, see you next time. Thank you too very much. You are Thank great. Thank you. Boss. Bye bye. <laughs> Goodbye.